Well, hey, if we haven't met, my name is Bert. I'm one of the past here. And uh, guys, thanks for getting up. Thanks for spending uh, your Sunday with us. It is Vision Sunday today. Uh, so we're going to take a little break from 1 Samuel, which is where we've been going through uh, as a church, to sort of talk about uh, where we're going as a church. And to set that up, I thought uh, I'd just begin by asking the room a question today. Um, how many of you have ever been to a children's t-ball game as an adult? Hands up if you've ever been. Yeah, right? Okay, yeah. Some of you, no, that's, that's fine. Like, there are better things you can uh, be entertained by. Uh, but, like, I've been, like, so my kids, uh, they, they did t-ball before the world fell apart with COVID. And, um, and it, it astounded me. I, I had only ever, like, seen t-ball from the perspective of a child, which basically made me believe that, you know, like, if I was on the, on the, on the, on the baseball field, like, for t-ball, I thought I was really good. Like I thought, like I thought, basically, like T-ball was okay. It's like the majors, but smaller. That's what I thought. And then I watched children, and, and quickly my perspective changed. Um, I'll never forget, like the first time, like you know, like you're watching the kids, right? And like you've got like ball here, T. Like this shouldn't be that hard, but you got that kid just right, and like just completely missing it, you know. And then finally, but like, how many of you ever seen that moment where like finally it connects? You know what I'm talking about? Like finally that ball is hit, and maybe, just by the grace of God, maybe that ball goes sailing across the field. Have you ever seen what happens when children who weren't expecting this see it in all its glory? Let me tell you what happens. Everyone abandons every position that they have on the field and just, ah, right? And they go like, I mean, like first base, second base, catcher, like pitcher, all the other, they all just converge on the same spot. And it's hilarious, <laughs> unless you're trying to win a game. And then what happens? Well, you kind of need somebody playing catcher. <laughs> you kind of need a first baseman. And, and I bring it up because, listen, sometimes what happens when it comes to church is we can be equally passionate. We see something go ahead of us, and our heart just goes after it, and, and we can just go running after it. But how many of you know, listen, if we're unified in our play, we stand a chance to be more effective. Am I preaching? You know, I'm about like, like if, if, if what we do is we go, listen, okay, yeah, my heart breaks for that, but what we're going to do as Solid Ground Church is make sure, okay, listen, we've got somebody covering home, and we've got somebody on first, and we've got somebody on second, so that when the time comes and the movement of God goes forward, we're better prepared for that to which we've been entrusted. And so, you know, listen, we, we say the mission of our church we say Solid Ground Church exists to connect people to Jesus Christ. That's what we do. Like we saw that with baptism today. We've seen that with, with how many lives transformed by nothing but the grace, power, and mercy of God as demonstrated through the gospel. And we're thankful for that. We exist to connect people to Jesus. We exist for those who are not yet here. We will never be content to just go, we've got our nice little club within our four walls. We've got everybody that we need. We don't believe as a church that it's about you or me. We believe it's about people who have yet to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, people that God is passionate about to the point where he has given his own blood. And so the question becomes, okay, well, if that's the mission, what's the play? And for us, we believe that the mission and the vision of our church is fulfilled through five values. These five values are how we execute that mission, and they are Powerful, like they are the DNA of our church. And today, I want to talk with you about what we're seeing with each one and where we're going with each one. So, very first value we have as a church is simply this, knowing God. Knowing God. We want you to know God. Did you know that? Did you know that you can have an actual personal relationship with God? You can talk to him, he'll talk back. That your sin can be forgiven, it can be washed away. That you can go to heaven and have no, like, fear about where you're going when you die? Did you know that God actually wants to relate to you as a parent in this life, not just heaven later on? I didn't know that for a long time. I thought God was somebody that you meet when you die. And I was shocked to learn that he wanted to be in my life right here before I die. And this is what it says about knowing God. I love this. Uh, the author of Hebrews, he's quoting the prophet Jeremiah, um, and he says this in Hebrews uh, 8, 10, and 11. He says, we'll bring it up here. I will put my laws in their minds and wire them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And, and I love this idea that okay, 
what God's heart is for you and me through Jesus is not for you to relate to him through clergy or someone else. He wants you to know him. And he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to change your heart. I'm going to bring you from spiritual death to life. Listen, if you don't know Jesus right now, the best that you can do is be kind of a good person, but even then you're still kind of selfish. What you need is for Jesus to change your heart, bring you from spiritual death to life, to give you a new heart. And when you, when you like turn your life around, when you turn from your sin and turn to him, what he'll do is he'll actually write into you who he wants you to become. And he, and he begins to mold you to become more and more like him. That's awesome. And what, and what we've done as a church is, listen, our very first thing that we want you to do is know God. And what we also want you to do under this, this, this uh, banner of knowing God is we want you to spend time with God. Like if, all you're, like, if all you're doing as far as your relationship with Jesus goes, to, like to fill your spiritual bucket is you come to a program that we offer, you are missing out on so much life. In the same way, if you only ate on Sundays, would you be hungry for the rest of the week? Yeah, you need to spend time with Jesus. Like get, get into the quiet place with him, open his word, I'm gonna speak to you through it. And this is like, my heart just beats for this for you as your pastor, which is why we talk about it so much. And, and one of the places that we talk about it, like because we're like, well, I don't even know where to begin there. That's why systematically we have instituted this thing called Growth Track, where what we do is we just spend time on plugging into our church and also learning how to spend time with God. And, and I got some exciting news for you. Growth Track is coming back. The Rona didn't kill it. And so guess what? Here's the next one. If you don't mark it on your calendars, Sunday, September 12th at 1.30 p.m., Growth Track is back. And if you're, like, if you're in a place like, oh, I'd like to know more about God. I, I'd love to know like, what, like, what, like, how God has wired me. Like, do I have gifts? Do I, like, what does God think about me? Like, Growth Track, Sunday, September 12th, be here. It's going to be really good, 1.30 p.m. And, that's, and that, that's just something that we've been very, very intentional about is you spending time with God. But here's where we're going for the future. We've recognized something that, okay, in this personal time that the Lord's just been amping up in us, what he's also been doing is preparing us as a corporate body. If I could say it like this, listen, imagine one day you were going to go run a marathon, right? I use that, like Boston Marathon, I'm in, you crazy person. Well, if you hadn't spent time training for that, would you make it? No. In the same way, the Lord has been training us to be a church of prayer. Your personal time with Jesus has been preparing you for something that's bigger than you. And this is where, this is where we're going. Um, we are going to be, uh, and, and we've seen a little bit, but we're, we're just going to amplify it like crazy. We're going to be a church that gets on our knees before heaven all the time. I said this to our, our uh, dream team before we reopened. I'll, I'll say it to you right now. Listen, we're a church that can be outsung, outpreached, and outserved, but we will never be outprayed. You understand? Is it a competition? No. But we're not, like, like, if I look and I find out about church that down the street was, 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 was spending 24 hours in prayer, my next response is going to be, okay, human beings can do that. Let's go for 48. Like, it, it inspires. Like, we are a church that can be outsung, outpreached, and outserved, but never outprayed. And so here's some things coming up. Number one, you should know that one of the things that we've integrated into the life of how we do Sunday mornings is we spend a significant amount of time as a church, like all the Dream Team and I, in here praying for you before you set foot in the door. Every Sunday, we're asking the Lord to pour out his spirit. We're asking for him to move because we recognize that none of this comes from showmanship. And so we spend time in corporate prayer. And the second thing is this. Um, we, we have instituted this thing, and there's more coming out of the pipe, called 21 Days of Prayer, where what we do is as a church, every single day, every single person in the church dedicates some time to praying for our community, praying for our nation, asking the Lord to move, asking the Lord to change them, and I can tell you the two months of the year that this will always be, August and January. 20, I mean, you can mark on your calendar, August and January. I don't know what's happening with the lights. The Lord agrees. I don't know. Look, all right, 21 days of prayer, 21 days of prayer, okay? Why these times? Well, because August is right before school comes back, and it feels like the year is reset then. And so what we want to do is give him our best, not our leftovers. And so when we start a new season, we want to start that by seeking God. Number two, January, hey, new year. So what we're going to do is we're going to give him the first of the year. So that's the first thing that's, listen, we're, we're bringing in 21 days of prayer twice a year. Number two, we have quarterly prayer nights. Quarterly. And the reason, and this is a time where, listen, if you've been here, you know, like the Lord, I mean, you just get a little bit of time for like the Lord to, to, to destroy your flesh a little bit when you're in here. And all of a sudden, like, you're just aware of the spirit in here. 
Like I, I mean, I, I was a, like, I was astounded last time um, when we were here in, in twenty or when we were here in prayer night. Like we got to this place where we weren't even asking people to pray for each other, and I was just hearing voices all over the room praying and seeking God on each other's behalf. It was beautiful. That's where we have the elders on hand to anoint the sick and pray for them with oil. It's where we do communion. And, and, and every quarter, we're doing prayer night. We, we pray until we don't. That's the attitude. So how long will it be? I don't know. Until Jesus says, you're done. And we need that. Because here's the truth. Like if we talk about being a church that exists for those who are not yet here, a church that exists to connect people to Jesus, here's the thing you have to understand about the ministry that we do in this community. And it's really, really crucial. And if you're taking notes, write this down. The most important thing we can do for our community is gather in prayer for it. Bar none. The, the, like, the most important thing that you and I can do for our community is to gather in prayer for it. Because number one, only Jesus saves the sinner. Only Jesus changes the heart. Only Jesus raises the dead, heals the sick, changes lives, sets the captive free, restores marriages, saves children. Like Only Jesus does that. And we need him to. Second, just from a practical place, if you want to love your community really well, you know what you do? You pray for it. Let me give you a little marriage tip. If you pray with your spouse, you'd be amazed how much you're not as angry at them. Because <gasps> it's hard for you to stay mad at somebody that you're praying for. Oh, man, that's free. That's free. So yes, our first value is knowing God, and that's where we see that beginning to manifest coming up. Second value that we have here as a church, and you may have picked up on this, is simply this, uh, to be rooted in the word. Rooted in the word. We are not a church that changes with the shifting sands of culture, who believe that somehow we've got it all figured out now that we live in the 21st century. What an arrogant thought. No, in fact, what we do is we root ourselves not on how we feel, not on what's popular, but on what God has said, the God who is the author of life, who knows how it should be lived. Motto, passage of Scripture for us here is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which says this, all Scripture is God-breathed, meaning coming from the nostrils of the mouth of God. <sighs> how much Scripture? All Scripture. The parts that you like? Sure. Parts that you don't like? Especially those. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we preach out of the Bible here. It's why the, the Scriptures are the final authority for all matters of life, doctrine, and practice. And we will not back down on that. Because, listen, as smart as you and I can be, have you just noticed this about you and I? We have this amazing ability to always skew things toward how we want to do something. Have you noticed that? that like if I, if, I, if I set my heart on something, I have the ability to convince myself that I should do it. And what we need is an authority that's greater than ourselves, that God has actually put in writing, God who actually knows how life should be lived. And we believe that comes from the Scriptures. Now, the next value we're going to spend a little more time on because it's very countercultural, particularly within the church. But this, we believe, is our next play for how we, we connect the world to Jesus. Third value as a church, we are empowered by the Spirit. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. I, I say this here at Solid Ground, we are a church that is charismatic with a seatbelt. And I want to explain this a little bit because unfortunately, let me just, like, we have, how many of you know we have a real spiritual adversary? Like the devil exists and he's trying to do everything he can to come against the works of God. Yes, you know that? All right. Have you noticed, like, I mean, this is just like a, it's a strategic play that what has happened is this, besides the lights, what has happened, what has happened is when it comes to the power of God being manifest among believers, how many of us sort of step back a little bit and we think that's for crazy people only, right? Like if I say to you, hey, God spoke to me, for many people are like, he's hearing voices, like, and isn't that crazy that among those who say they believe in a world and realm beyond this one, we have a hard time believing that that world touches into this one. And so consequently, what, what, what the power of the gospel among us rests on usually is arguments, being really like good at persuading someone of something, and very practical, small things. And when it comes to the power of God being manifest among believers, here's why many of us step back, because we've only ever seen it either abused or used by those who are crazy. Like, listen, I love my charismatic brothers and sisters, but some of y'all are nuts. 
Okay, and so what you do is, is, is it man, and we and we associate the, the power and moving of the Holy Spirit with emotional manifestations that I would argue are actually contrary to the scriptures. As you read First Corinthians twelve through fourteen, one of the things that it talks about is let everything be done in order. But 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 what has happened is like we, we see televangelists who are out to make a buck, and they talk about having the power of God. And we go, all right, that's wrong, and we step back. We see emotional outbursts that I would argue also come from the person, not the spirit. Because again, the, the scriptures that we say we are rooted in says that the, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets, meaning the Holy Spirit does not possess people. All right. And so what we do is we step back. And, and I think this is systematic of the enemy because what he does is he goes, listen, you don't want that. You don't want to be weird. You don't want to be a crazy person. That's only for people who don't have it all together. So listen, you might as well just not have anything to do with that, but you are throwing out your birthright as a child of the king. And the thing about it is, if you just view the activity of the Spirit as weird, you'll never ask him for it. And yet, when it comes to what Jesus clearly teaches for his disciples, us, this is what the Lord Jesus himself said. John 14, 12, he says, very truly I tell you, whoever, and you're a whoever, believes in me will do the works I've been doing. What did Jesus do? Come on. Was he not known for healing the sick, raising the dead, speaking prophetically into lives? Can you look at the ministry of Jesus and remove that and say it's the same? Nope. They'll be doing the works I've been doing. Not the preaching I'll be doing, I've been doing, the works I've been doing. And they'll do even greater than these. Now, how crazy does the Holy Spirit have to move that we look at them and be like, yeah, Jesus did something nice, but actually, come on. All right? Greater than these, because I'm going to the Father. Why, why is this going to happen? Because I'm going to heaven and I want to move through you. <laughs> And so he concludes, he says, so again I, I say, ask. Or just, uh, actually, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, go back, go back, go back, go back. All right, hold on, hold on. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> that was the ask, seek, and knock, but it wasn't. All right, so look, I'm a human being. So look, and what we find in the life of the New Testament church, and you should just know this, is the assumption that God is doing this stuff. They took Jesus at his word seriously. So this is what the verse I'm about to bring up. This is Paul arguing with people in the church of Galatia because they're believing that what they should do is go back to observing the Jewish law and that, and that such a thing will make them right with God, which is so contrary to salvation by grace through faith. And look at what Paul appeals to in Galatians 3.5. It's just a given to him. So now here's what it says. He says, all right, so again, I ask you, does God give his spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by you believing what you heard? I mean, it's just a part of the life of the church. Isn't that crazy? Look, again, like think, here's what Paul writes to the church in Corinth who are abusing spiritual gifts. He says this, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Isn't that crazy? Could we not argue that perhaps now in our day and age, the number one neglected gift among the believers and saints is the gift of prophecy? Think about how this like, dichotomy is switched. It, like, now, like, you know what gift we, we emphasize above everything else is teaching, right? Like, I mean, like, like many of you, you're here, and, and praise God for you, like, like, but one of the things that first drew you to this church was the teaching, or like when it comes to being trained as a disciple of Jesus, it's about going to a seminary so you can learn how to teach. It's all about teaching, teaching, rational, rational, teaching, expounding, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And yet the scriptures say, listen, go ahead and desire the gifts, that's good especially prophecy. You know why? Because, and Paul writes this later on in 1 Corinthians, he goes, he goes, because if you're together and you have prophets in turn, just two or three, and everything's being tested and weighed uh, what's being said, and somebody comes in who's not a believer, and they look at that person and they tell them what's in their heart, won't the person conclude God is among you? Different way of connecting people to Jesus than most of us are used to. And here's the really cool thing. As we've been praying and asking the Lord to raise this gift up among us, he's been doing it. And it's been really fun. I, 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 there are a lot of stories I could give you right now that we've been seeing in the last season, but they, some of them would violate confidentiality, so I'll give you two that I love. Number one, 
We got a guy in our church who uh, not too long ago was feeling, uh, or he was in a place where he needed to sell his car. And so this, uh, this, this couple, and, you know, the car wasn't that expensive. Like, so I'm not talking about, like, Rolls Royce, like, just, you know, people doing, all right. And, um, and so this couple comes to him, and, and they're like, hey, we'd like to buy the car. And as they stand in front of him, like, the Holy Spirit just speaks to him, and he's like, uh, they're having trouble paying the rent last month. You need to just give them the car. And so he's like, chews on it, prays on it, and then he goes to him, he's like, hey, listen, um, this is going to sound crazy, but I believe God just told me to give you this car. And when he says that, the wife just begins to break down and sob. She's like, we couldn't pay the rent last month. We had no idea how we were going to get this car and also keep a roof over our heads. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Desire of the spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. Have another one I love. We have, a, we have a woman in our church who has a relative who is struggling with some severe mental health issues. And everywhere that she went, uh, she had to be removed from it. And so uh, this woman and her husband, they're praying for this relative, like, what are we going to do? And one night, uh, the woman's at home, <laughs> and uh, just kind of out of nowhere, the Lord just goes, go to Big Lots. <laughs> and she's like, I, I have to go to Big Lots. So literally, she leaves her husband and kids at the dinner table. I, I'm going to Big Lots. Well, why? I don't know, but I'm going to Big Lots. So she, like, so she goes to Big Lots. She's wandering around Big Lots in all its glory, and she's like, all right, then starts to leave, and on her way out, there just happens to be a table right at the exit. You know, like, you go to Walmart sometimes, she's like, like the Girl Scouts are, are set up with a, a table there, and there's this table, okay? And this group's like, hey, we're a nonprofit, we're accepting donations, uh, if you'd be interested in giving to us. And she's like, oh, sorry, I don't have any cash. And they're like, well, we take credit. And she's like, of course you do, you know? <laughs> you know? And so, okay, fine. So she uh, gives them a little bit of money, and she's like, just kind of curious, like, curious, stay with me. She's kind of curious, like, what, what is it that you guys do? And like, well, we're actually an inpatient mental health clinic uh, for people, and just having the exact thing that her relative needed. That's cool, right? Why? Because the God who says, earnestly desire the gifts, intends to give them if we'll ask in faith. And here's where we're going. I mean, I, I could just give you story after story how we're beginning to see the Lord speak and speak and speak to this church. And I'm thankful for that. Which is why coming down the line, we're going to create a school of, of the prophets. And we're going to dedicate time, because Sunday morning isn't the place for it. We're going to dedicate time for those like to discern if they've got gifting in that area, to learn how to hear the Lord, to learn how to prophesy, what that means, and, and how to do it in faith so that we can test people, so we don't just put random people on the stage who might... Uh, abuse your trust. But yeah, we're going there. On top of that, see, I see a day coming for this church where the Lord's hand is stretched out and he heals the sick in miraculous ways. And we want to seek his face on that. I, I can tell you coming up, one of the things that we're going to do is just beg God for it. And one of the places, like we actually got this in a prophetic word this morning and it's dead on. We're going to spend a day, 24 hours as a church, where we pray, where somebody's going to be here all hours of the day, praying and begging God to stretch out his hand. And we'd love for you to be part of it. Because again, it starts with God moving, not us. So yes, one of our values is that we value being empowered by the Spirit, not to be weird, but to be effective in ministry. And to demonstrate the heart of God for his children. Next thing that we value here, number four, is this community life. Community life. We, like, I, I, we as a church, and I'll just say I, to my core, believe that if you want to grow spiritually, it won't happen unless you connect relationally. Can I just say again? You can't grow spiritually unless you connect relationally. You need people in your life who will give you accountability, belonging, and care. People who actually know you, who love you, who have earned the place to speak into your life, who will be there for you. And I had to, which is why we, we offer community groups. Sign-ups begin again in August. Be ready for it. Our groups come together. They study, but it's not just a Bible study. In fact, if you're like, I just need to go to another Bible study, your problem isn't that you need another Bible study. It's not that you need to know more things. It's that you need to love better. And they're coming back. Let me encourage you to be part of one. And let me just say this also as a qualifier, because sometimes what happens is this. Sometimes what happens is people, I'll give the community group thing a shot. They show up for like 
a week or two, then they leave, and they're mad that the group wasn't there for them, which is ridiculous. Like, no, you'll get out of it what you put into it. And, and I believe this is biblical. Ecclesiastes uh, 4 verse 9 says it like this. Two are better than one. Shocker. Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who fa falls and has no one to help them up. One of the things that the enemy wants to do is isolate you. So that you're not growing, you're not loving, you're not becoming more like Jesus. And this, by the way, while fun and great, is not community. This resembles an audience more than a family. Look, I, I, I sometimes catch flack for this, but let me just say it. If your week is so crazy, and it shouldn't be, but if your week is ever so crazy that you have to choose between being in Sunday morning worship and being in a community group, choose the community group. Because you're going to be cared for. You're going to experience life together. You're going to be prayed with. You're going to get to actually know people, and you need that if you're going to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Because here's the truth. God designed you to do spirituality and community. Did you know that? Let me say it again. You can write it down. God designed you to do spirituality in community. When we read these New Testament epistles, letters to churches, let me just point out that the you in most, if not all instances, is plural. The New Testament is written to groups of people, not individuals, with the exception of just a couple places. Why? Because spirituality is a lot more communal than we give it credit. All right, so that's four of our values. Here's the last one. Number five, we value reaching the lost. We do. We do. Twelve years ago, my wife and I came back to this area to plant this church. We grew up here in Lewis, went off to school. We were in Missouri. We were in Boston. Thought about going to California because we thought, hey, we're somewhere we haven't been. And then uh, the Lord kind of intervened, and that's a story for another time. It was like, I want you to go back to Delaware and plant a church. And we're like, all right. And in the beginning, when we were praying through, like, okay, what is this supposed to be? Like, Lord, who do you, like, who do you want us to reach? And, and, and what should this church look like? I had a dream. And in the dream, I was standing on 2nd Street in Lewis. You know 2nd Street, come on, agave. Oh. And I look, and there's this parade going across in front of me, and confetti's falling, and people, people are cheering and celebrating. And in my mind, I think this just represents the kingdom of God, the work of God on the earth going forward. And, and then I, I look across the street, and I see this guy that I went to high school with, and he's got these uh, show dogs in front of him, these prim, proper, like, poodle, like, just really, really pretty, like, Westminster dog show dogs. And I'm not even, like, a dog show guy, but I was impressed by those dogs. Those are some nice dogs. And he represents the church. He represents this, this way of things where church is for the pretty. Like you can be part of the family if you've got it together. Come on. You, you, can, you can be in if you perform. Or let me just say it like this, if you're good at making people think that you do. And I looked at my feet. And I saw these mutts. These dirty, disheveled dogs. One of them, you guys remember the movie Benji? Remember, ben, like, remember Benji when Benji comes out of the river and Benji's all like gacked up? There's, there's a dog looking like Benji. And this one dog, this, and again, dream, I'm not on anything. Um, this dog, this Doberman Pinscher, looks at me and it speaks. Here's what it said. It said, will you have us? And instantly, like, in me, I feel this, this tension because I know, like, okay, if I say yes to these, I won't have the ones across the street. But if I say no to these, like, who's going to care for them? And so I'm like, yeah. And instantly when I say yeah, it's like they're my dogs. They're I'm trying not to cry. Like, they're, they're jumping up on me, and they're licking me, and we're, and, and we're rolling around, and I wake up, and that's it. And I was like, that's the church. Right there. We're a church for those who are jacked up. 
We're a church, a church for those who are forgotten. We're a church for those that other churches wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. We're a church that needs to be saturated in the grace and love and mercy of Jesus because while the rest of the world forgets, he does it. So if you're part of SGC, congratulations, you're a dog. <laughs> We value this. Do you know why? Like to my bones, don't like, am I the only one who believes this simple truth that lost people matter to God? We got a slide for that too. Boom, lost people matter to God. <laughs> and we believe it. We say, listen, like when we look at the, the, the metrics of Sussex County, and we see the numbers of people who identify as unaffiliated with anything, and it's the majority, we believe every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to God, period. And you know where we get this? We get this out of the heart of God. This is what Jesus himself said about himself in Luke 19.10. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's the mission of Jesus. It's why we invite. It's why we reach out in our community because we believe we have to earn the right to be heard. There have been enough voices saying they represented Jesus. We want to show love before we show anything else. You'd be amazed how powerful this is. I have a friend who's a pastor. You know how he became a Christian? Listen to this. Listen to this. When he, when he was a teenager, his mother was diagnosed with cancer. And when this diagnosis came in and she was sick and she was going through chemo, there was a church that showed up that they had just kind of been to. They weren't members of. And they showed up with a bunch of, they said, listen, like, like things are rough. We, we just wanted to bring you food and, and bless you. And, and let's, like their family's like a lot of ours where like we don't take charity well, right? So they're like, well, you know, we appreciate that. But unfortunately, like we don't have any freezers to keep this food in. So sorry, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Church went, got it. They left. They came back with a huge freezer. Here's food and also the means to keep it. And my friend, whose name is Kevin, he went, if that's who Jesus is, I want to be around him. Why? Because that's the heart of God. Look, can I, can I just tell you something? Like, listen, we value doing this well. We really do. Like, like, listen, we put a lot of work into what you experience here on Sunday. Hey, fun fact, I work really hard on these talks. It's not like I just sit down and it's like, like, like you know, the heavens open and God's like right down verbatim. No, that's why I screwed up the scripture earlier. Like, no, it don't work that way. But can I tell you something about being part of the life of a church? You should just know this. If all we care about is doing church with excellence, we will miss the heart of God. If all it's about is church-wide events and, and, and you know, just doing something for our own, we will miss the heart of God that beats for the lost. So as a church, we're intentional about this. That's why we tithe every week to, to organizations that reach people far from God. That's like their mission, practically and just purely evangelistically. It's why we give like crazy to Young Life. It's why we give like crazy to Samaritan's Purse. It's why we give like crazy to Zoe Ministries who help uh, women who are victims of trafficking. It's why we give like crazy to um, uh, Mercy Multiplied. Like why? Like to help like young women in Christ. Like why do we do this? Because we believe that the heart of God beats for those who are forgotten. It's why we as a church do church-wide events to bless our community. It's why when you came in, there were something as simple as toiletries sitting in the lobby because they're going to the community resource center. You know why? Because we don't want to just be a church in Lewis. We want to be a church that's for Lewis. You understand? And, and, and let me just tell you something. I, I'm going to be honest. This is an area where we love, but I think we can do better, and I think we're about to. Why? How? Well, we're about to become more intentional and strategic. We're forming this thing called an outreach team. If your heart beats to serve people, I mean, that's where you, that's how God has wired you. Let me encourage you to be a part of it. In fact, planning meeting is taking place today at 2 p.m. right here in this building. 
Like if you, if you admit, I want to reach my community with the gospel of Jesus, I want to serve them the way God has demonstrated compassion and mercy to me, be here, 2 o'clock. And what would happen? Guys, come on. What would happen if a church that exists to connect people to Jesus operated on those five fronts like crazy? Come on. What would happen if we were a people who dedicated our lives to knowing God? If we were a people who were rooted in the word, if we were people who really were empowered by the spirit, if we were a people who experienced life together so that when we, re- like when we reached somebody, they didn't just sort of drift out, but instead they had a community of support around them, helping them grow their faith. And what would happen if we were a church who was obsessed with reaching the lost? Now, here's the crazy part. Here's what I've been praying for. You ready? Like, this is just, like, I, I beg God for this. Yes, I, I beg him for the spirit to move. Because I think there are a lot of things in this generation that only revival will heal. I do. I, I think there's a lot among us that unless the Holy Spirit shows up in powerful ways, nothing's going to change. I don't think I can counsel out demons. You understand? So yes, I'm praying for God to move. But here's the other thing. I'm praying for God to move us. With me. I'm praying, okay, like, Lord, please stretch out your hand, but also, Lord, would you move me so that my heart is intentional in looking for those who are not yet in the kingdom? So all that said, let me wrap up. I want to pray for us before we go. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Today, while, while we're here, let's join together in prayer. Father, we thank you. Because this church was your idea. It wasn't even mine. And Lord, how, how much um, you've moved in spite of me, not because of me. Lord, you're, you've willed for this to be here. And so much, I mean, like you've just supernaturally provided for this church to exist. And we know that the best is yet to come. You're doing it. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being part of what you're doing. Like, my gosh, you don't need us, but you, you want to you do the dance with us to include us in it. Like, Lord, thank you. And so, Spirit of God, I ask you, make us effective in the proclamation of the gospel. To the name of Jesus, we glorified in and through us. Lord, you see Sussex County. You see Rehoboth. You see Lewis, Milton, Millsboro. You, like you, Dewey. Oh, God, Dewey. And you love them. Please save them. Look, while we're, while we're praying, I, I, I want to just give you this invitation. If today, maybe you've been religious, I don't know. But if you would say that you don't know Jesus, like if, if, if you can't think of a time in your life where Jesus came in, saved you from your sin, changed your heart, and invited you into life with him, it could be that's never happened. But the good news is it doesn't have to stay that way. God is pro you. To the point where he sent Jesus into the world to die for you, to take away your sin. Jesus died in your place so that you could be forgiven, cleansed, and saved. And so you can know that's true. God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. A promise to give you new life as well. And all he asks is this. Like if you want to be saved, if you want Jesus to come in and transform your heart and make you a new person, he will. Here's all that he asks, that you turn from your sin and turn to him. And you go, how do I do that? By asking. So listen, if that's where you are, I want you just to pray with me right now, and here's what we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Lord, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for me and that you raised him from the dead so that I can have new life with you. Lord, I want to receive that new life now. I turn from leading my own life. I turn from living for me. I turn from my sin. I repent of it. I turn my back on it now. And I turn to you. Please fill me with the Holy Spirit. Make me a new person. Make me like you. Give me new life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Look, church fam, before we go, if you prayed with me just now, I want you to know you didn't finish the race. You just started it, and we want to help you take your next steps. So in the backs of the seats in front of you, there are connect cards. Please fill one out. Let's know you did that. Listen, if you're watching online and you pray to, to, to receive Jesus with me right now, we create a special website just for you. If you go on over to solidground.church slash first steps, you're going to find a bunch of free resources right there to help you go forward. Guys, at this time, bless you. Have a great week. And uh, man, it's 4th of, of July next Sunday. So have fun.